All right, folks, I get to go into my little Ballywick where I get to geek out a little bit because I get to talk to some folks that I really, really just love their work. Amanda Silva and Rick Jaffa, who are the, the minds of helping write some of the scripts behind the uh, dawn of the Planet of the Apes and now Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which comes out in a few weeks. Of course, many other projects as well. Amanda and Rick, thank you for joining us. Well, thank, thank you, you Brandon. Yeah, appreciate it. I tell you what, I have to confess, I am a diehard Planet of the Apes fan, and I was a tough <laughs> sell, bro. I was I was a tough, tough sell, and I was so impressed. You have no idea how impressed I was. So have, help everybody out understand, because not everybody's familiar with the process. So um, at what point were you guys uh, developing the script, and then how did it go from there? Are you talking about? Uh, let's let's start with let's start with Dawn of the Planet of the Apes first, and then we'll kind of move. Why right, right the right planet first? Yeah. yeah. So you want to start with Rise or Dawn? Uh, well, let's let's, let's start with the beginning. However, you want to go. Okay. Um, well, the the uh, Rise was really our original idea, and uh, we had uh, gone you know, when we we came up with the idea. We went to Fox and and said, you know, uh, we have a way to reinvent one of your franchises, and we're really excited about it. And they said, great, come on in and. And so we pitched him the idea, and the thing is, the idea was kind of, it was so pure that the pitch was really only 15 minutes, you know, it was very short, but uh, very, um, I think very powerful, and I think that uh, very clear as to where the franchise could go. But uh, it started off with uh, um, a, a bunch of articles about families that had raised chimpanzees in their homes. And uh, and how all those stories would always end badly, and uh, uh, we had been cutting those articles out for a long time, and then uh, and staring at them and wondering where there was, you know there has to be a movie in here somewhere. And then uh, one day, you know, a little voice uh, in my head said, you know what, it's Planet of the Apes. And so from that, you know, we brought in the science uh, side of it, and the story came together really quickly. So, anyways, that's how that's how Rise got started. It really is an amazing transition, too, because it just seems so obvious, yet it hadn't been done for so long, and it was just so well put together with the transition, and, and now we move into, you know, the second film, and, you know, Andy Serkis returns to just bring uh, Caesar to life with this amazing motion capture. I mean, the first film was just breathtaking. The technology has moved so rapidly, I can't even imagine how great oh, it is now. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, we had this, when we first saw the, the, um, how far the technology had come in just the past three years, we were blown away. Just the first three shots we saw was uh, was Maurice in the rain. And you could see, Maurice is the orangutan, and you mm -hmm. could see the rain on his fur. It was, it was yeah, uh, droplets, droplets of water. rain, the matted fur. It's just, the detail um, is beautiful. When you when you go from pitch to the initial drafting of the whole story and you start to kind of piece all this together and you have this sort of character that's at least alluded to in the original franchise and now you're really going to put so much meat to it. How do you sit down and what did you do to kind of sit down and create Caesar and, and who Caesar really is? Well, um, it's interesting because there there is that um, moment I believe in Escape from the Planet of the Apes, where there's a mention of one ape that uh, was the first ape to speak, and he stood up and said no. And I believe that that in that in that moment it was, they referred to the ape as Aldo, and then of course in Con Conquest of the Planet of the Apes that ape became Caesar, and. Um, so we knew that, you know, we were big Apes fans too, and we had gone back and watched all the old movies. But uh, um, so we knew that. Um, but in essence, we knew that we had a Moses story, and we needed a leader, and um, uh, you know, we needed a place to start with that leader. And for us, it was, you know, even the moment where um, the character of Franklin in the lab finds the uh, finds the baby and shows it to. Uh, to uh, Will, you know, J the James Franco character. That's really, in a way, Moses in the in the bulrushes and by the river. And it, that's you know, that's kind of how that started. And so once, so we knew we had to, you know, uh, get the audience um, behind uh, Caesar as a character and, and behind the setup. But once he got to the facility, we knew that that was really going to be the planting of the seeds of the revolution. And so. 
in terms of his character, that's where we started. And, and once we knew he got to this facility, then and then then it just really started falling into place for us. We, you know, in terms of the characters of the apes and Maurice and Buck and and Rocket and so forth. And so from then, it went pretty quickly. Well, I just want to say that like that uh, it's an interesting idea, and it was challenging and a little scary to think: Will the audience relate to an ape? Because um, you know, uh, how do you do that? And so when we raised him in the home, we, we had challenges. We had him fall in love and be lovable. And, um, you know, the audience knew that when he attacked that neighbor, he was just trying to protect his, his grandfather. Right. Um, yeah, uh, it was really a bridge of two worlds because yeah. he was acting, uh, he was having the emotions of a human being, but he was reacting like an ape. I mean, very territorial, very aggressive, you know, uh, very physical. And uh, so it was really the marriage of those two things. And, and part of the thing with Caesar, which moves in very well into the second movie, Dawn, is that he's really a character caught between two worlds. You know, he's raised by humans. His attachments were founded in a human home, in a human world. But he's also, physically, he is an ape. And uh, uh, so he's in his, his loyalties now, you know, obviously lie with his new family. So, well, uh, yeah. and it just does such a good job because, you know, almost everyone can relate to animal attack stories and, and different instances of tragedy that have happened. And Caesar responding isn't anything that's sort of out of the known that most people can relate to. And then, of course, the way he responds and still becomes, you know, so loving of his yeah. human caregivers. He never lost sight of that. And yeah. I know that, that that that's at least been alluded to in some of the early trailers that in the second film, we still have some of that. Caesar's looking back at a video clip, you know, he's still connected to the human world and still struggling so much. So now that we move ahead, I mean, you keep him grounded, yet we have to move forward knowing that these two groups are really not going to be reconcilable, right? Well, it's a struggle, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. a struggle. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, you're 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 right. You, I think you really hit on it. And, and Caesar's, uh, you know, uh, look, I, I think that uh, all of us want um, everyone to get along with one another. And I think that's you know uh, a goal for a lot of people, a wish or desire for a lot of people. And uh, uh, but it's always you know going to be a struggle. And I think Caesar's really caught between caught between those two groups. The one trailer I really was just, it goes by so fast, but most people may, may not even catch this. I'm, again, revealing my geekdom. Um, <clears throat> the orangutan has written on the wall some rules already. So they've already sort of created some infrastructure and some order based on the different hierarchy that we understand from the original sort of uh, franchise. So now... Where where are we at? We have we we know that there's a, they they've they've been thriving and they're in this little world. How far do we get to see? How far have the apes sort of organized themselves? They've got a thriving community in the woods, and they've kind of come home. Like at the end of the last movie, Caesar said he's home, and so now he's he's a father. It's about ten years later, he has a family, and as you as you noticed, you know they've. They've got a, a society there that um, they've written on the wall because they're teaching the kids, and they've obviously got written. They're, they're beginning to have written language, and um, and uh, the apes are working together. You see how they live and how they hunt for food, and and they're at peace. And yeah, how they've managed to survive. Yeah. So you know, in terms of just exactly how far, you know, I, I think that's in the scene of the movie, you know. Oh, no, no I understand, I, I, obviously. Um, but yeah, but, you, but you've got a keen eye. I mean, they definitely, they're definitely trying to make it work, you know, as a society. Absolutely, absolutely. It's very intriguing. It's such a great concept. Folks, we're talking with Amanda Silver and Rick Jaffa, the, the guys who helped come up with this original idea to save Planet of the Apes and bring it back, thank goodness, because... Uh, it was just such a long, stagnant process for so long. And um, this is hardly the only franchise you guys have really been involved with. I know I want to get to real quick a little bit about working with James Cameron. I know he's he's working on filming, I guess, all three Avatar films, sequels, call them what you will, this massive vision that he has. How were you guys brought into that? And what was sort of his vision that he, he helped, you know, listen, this is what we want to do? Or was it the other way around? 
Well, um, we we were hired with and brought into the project with uh, two other writers, um, Josh Friedman and Shane Salerno, and uh, so you know we um, we were brought into Jim's process and had been working with him. So he we did not come to him pitching ideas. You know he he brought us into his world and his process of Avatar and stuff. And so um, so we all worked closely with him and have been working closely with him. And it's been going, you know, it's been going great. I mean, we, it's been a great experience. Uh, and, you know, we can't really talk about creative issues, you know, uh, with Avatar. But, uh, but we can't tell you that, uh, you know, we worked closely with him and the other two guys, and, uh, and it's been great. Yeah, it's been a, the, the thrill of a lifetime working with Mr. Cameron. And the uh, uh, learning curve is very steep, and we're very, very excited about Avatar. And yeah, we're an so honor. sorry yeah. we're, and honored. <laughs> and we're so sorry we're not allowed to talk about it at all. Oh, no, it's okay. I, I won't put you in any landmines, I promise. Um, the part I want I wanted to get to just just I, I wanted to preview that you are working in that in that universe which is exciting in and of itself and especially because of to me there's a lot of similarities to the planet of the apes environment uh, a lot of the CGI motion capture that was accomplished through the planet of the apes reboot so now we see a little bit more of the extension of the avatar universe it seems like common sense so how much cuz working with Jim has got to be uh, you mentioned it just an amazing honor and privilege but in his head um, how how does this sort of kind of come out of him to explain to you? I mean, how does this work? Is he, is he, for instance, Michael Bay actually creates like an animated version of his entire movie to help convey what's rolling around in his head because it's you know, there's so much and and for Jim to confess that there's three full films <laughs> that's happening, right. this is just mind blowing. Right. Yeah. Well, well, you know, he's a man full, uh, full of lots of incredible ideas and, and, and desires in terms of entertaining uh, uh, audiences, and, and he's got a lot to say. And, you know, he just, he's got just so many, uh, he's just so many ideas and so many, you know, um, uh, it's brilliant moments that, uh, you know, that uh, that he wants to, to put on film and so forth. So, um, you know, he, uh, but, you know, he it's, Again, we, we would really rather not get too deeply into it, but like I said, he's, he's brought us into it, and it's been terrific. I think one of the cool things, if I, if I may just take a, a step back, is that uh, when we first came up with the idea for Rise, you know, uh, we, you know we're not the most technologically uh, uh, sophisticated writers. You know, we, we write uh, characters and so forth, and we didn't even realize that the technology didn't exist when we first sold them the idea for Rise. This is like back this. in 2007. Yeah, yeah. It's like to do this. Wow. CGI. We had no idea. We just figured if we wrote it, you know, there'd be ways to do it without, you know, um, without using real chimps and real apes. And by, uh, that, and by yeah. the way, that was not even an option. It was never even an option because it's so much against the theme of the movie. But at any rate, or men in suits, you know, or, or puppets and so forth, we just assumed it could be done. And the technology didn't really exist until Avatar, which is kind of the one of the life's ironies is that uh, if it weren't for Avatar, Apes would have never gotten made. And here we are now with the privilege of getting to work on, on you know, the sequels to Avatar. So uh, it's kind of cool. It is really cool, and it is definitely a good fit and just seems like a no-brainer to me to see all of this sort of come together with you guys putting the the meat of these characters behind this incredible vision that he has and he's used in that franchise. And then, of course, to see apes continuing to grow. The studio is already committed to a third film. We know that as well. And um, I want to plug one last thing to make sure people know, because, I mean, it's just so cool to have all this happening at one time for you guys is, you know, you were able to help also help rejuvenate and put a little bit of a contribution on the Jurassic World part as well. Yeah, we're excited about that. You know, um, yeah, we came in uh, at a very early stage and, and met with uh, Mr. Spielberg and, and were able to, you know, toss out ideas and, and hear his ideas, which, again, it's like with with uh, with Jim. I mean, you sit in a room with... Uh, with uh, you got to pinch yourself. And, <laughs> yeah, and you can't actually believe you're sitting there. And, and he's so, he's just so brilliant as well. And, uh, you know, it's just crazy to hear, to you know, we've trading ideas and of course I and mean, he'd throw out ideas and it blows your mind and you kind of sit there and try not to get too excited at <laughs> the moment you know but uh so yeah we're real excited about our contribution to that and uh, uh from what we what we hear the movie's going really well yeah it's well in production we've covered a lot of that folks so you could click to that as well we'll link to some of the uh 
uh, tags there so you can navigate yourself to the latest articles that we've got uh, there on the dispatch. And so, Amanda and Rick, when you guys sit down and, and you have these different things and you, and you, sp you talked a lot about the spark that worked with apes, but um, how is it that your work, how do you guys sort of operate from a writing team standpoint? Well, they're different. They're always different stages. The hardest part is when the, the idea when the germ of the idea comes and you know there's a story there, it's gonna, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but it's almost like you're on an archaeological dig and the story is buried and you've got to dig. It's not like you're creating the story. It's like you're finding the story. You're discovering it. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, when the story is good and it's working, it's, it already exists and you've got to kind of uh, discover it. So that, that part of it is just a lot of talking and sometimes it's discouraging, you know, it's like you, you lunch comes and then dinner comes and you don't, you haven't cracked it. And, and then other times it's just thrilling because, uh, you see something clearly and, and when it's working, you kind of almost see it at the same time, the way you would if you were, you know, digging. But then the other hard work is when you're actually sitting at the computer and the characters, then the characters really start to come alive when you get to, in situations and they're talking to each other and uh, they're, they're solving problems or uh, creating problems for each other. And, um, and uh, a lot of that is, is uphill writing and some of it is downhill writing when the characters kind of reveal themselves to you. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean to make it sound magical, but... Uh, sometimes yeah, it feels a, a little yeah. magical too. It's yeah. Like the char like Caesar, uh, for us became a very real character, and yeah. it's it's all it's all about following him and his journey, and it still is. Yeah, he really did come alive at some point, and and uh, it was interesting. Our daughter's uh, about to turn nineteen, and she was saying the other day we were, we we were driving somewhere, and we saw one of the big posters for for Dawn, and uh, she said that she really felt like she grew up with Caesar. And it's true in some ways he really was a bit of a sibling to our two kids. You know? <laughs> because, Not really. Because, but well, but no, but we, you know, we talk about But him you and, talk about him probably all the time. Are you at your dinner table and you guys just yeah, start yeah. an idea? You got broccoli in your mouth. There's an idea that pops in your head and you're looking at your spouse going, yeah, that would be a great idea. And your daughter's like, all right, Caesar again. Okay, I got it, you know. Yeah, yeah great, you know, Christmas, well, listen, Caesar, 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 Caesar gives a gift. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there'd be a surprise <laughs> gift from Caesar under the tree. You know, or a birthday cards, you know, from Caesar or whatever. He's been around with us for a long time, well, since 2007, or isn't that? 2006, really. So, uh, anyway, so, you know, look, we, in terms of our process, uh, we, you know, there is a germ of an idea, or it comes from something we've read, or something we've always wanted to explore, and we spend a, spend a lot of time just talking it out, and throwing out ideas, and mapping out different, you know, possible journeys, and, and plot points, and so forth, and and uh, uh, and then you know we we get into that outline phase or, or uh, you know trying to put a shape to it and get that down either on the computer or on cards or something and and then eventually you know we start writing the script and uh, sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's not as hard but you know we spend a lot of time and put a lot of effort into it. It's a great chance to talk to you guys and really start to see that and understand that more and share that with folks because I think it really just adds so much more depth and meaning when you sit in the theater and, and you get to get a little dose of that journey along with you. Like you said, you guys have been on this journey for seven years now or longer, and it's great to be able to – we're going to sit there, we're going to watch this film and realize that there's been this incredible backstory and journey that, that comes along with the Apes franchise in particular, and then even more so later on once Avatars and some of these other projects start to manifest themselves. and. Is there one project, like a dream project, that you could uh, say, listen, you know what, I'd always love to get my hands on that someday? Oh, you mean like a piece of existing material? Yeah, like, like remaking one or a certain type of franchise, something else that you're like, oh, man, you know, it's like a, you know. Well, look, I think that's a great question, and I think that uh, we have been blessed with uh, being involved with uh, these franchises that we have been and. And um, uh, the reality is, uh, we're, we're kind of where we are now, our dream project would be to create our own, you know. Uh, mm, and cool. So we're working on that now, different, you know, different arenas and ideas. But uh, uh, it's interesting, too. It's kind of cyclical, you know. Because um, with Apes, we, uh, you know, grew up with it, of course, and, and uh, really w wanted to... Uh, we, we, you know, we'd have been really happy if someone had, it, it, you know, recreated it to a way that got... Uh, 
got this thing jump started again, and uh, it just kind of happened to be us, you know. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we, I'm thrilled when I hear uh, people, you know, say like, like what you said earlier about how you just, you're a big fan, you, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and we we were really, and and I have to say too, uh, this goes for Matt Reeves and uh, Mark Bombach and Dylan Clark and Peter Chernin and everybody that's been involved, uh, all the guys at WADA, everyone that's been involved with uh, with the Apes uh, franchise is that, uh, you know, we really wanted to please the core audience as well as create a new audience. You know, we really wanted that. And, and when we hear from people that were big Apes fans and big sci-fi people, that they're really into it and they were skeptical and it's like, you know, like, how is this going to be pulled off? And we hear that. I can't tell you. It's, it's, it's a thrill beyond words really. And, uh, and we've, like I said, been lucky that, uh, that it worked. And, uh, and then, um, and then the second movie, you know, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to talk to Matt Reeves or not, but he is really dedicated to the apes franchise and really knowledgeable and really into it and has done a masterful job. I think, uh, in this film. That's just great to hear. And I couldn't agree more. This is what, you know, as a, a fan of any movie or you're growing up with something, one of the things you want to do is add to that. You don't want to have something negative included or take away from it. And nothing about these two films appear to be anything more than just adding more to this legacy, more to the universe and the franchise. And it's an exciting time. And I definitely appreciate you guys carving out time to talk to me and share with our, our viewers and our, our listeners and readers to about everything and how all this sort of manifests itself. Cause I get that asked a lot. It's like, how do you, you know, how did you know this and that? And what well, you know, you got to talk to these guys. They're really just humans like us. They got a day job. And in this case, you guys are living together, writing this stuff. I can't even imagine how that must be. Yeah, it's great, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. It, who, 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 you guys, you guys get into those heated, heated moments though, where you're like, you know, you really do disagree, or you just kind of let it sit and manifest, and then eventually it just kind of takes care of itself. Well, we made rules at the top when we started working together because we were already married. We said, you know, we don't bring, we leave all the disagreements at the office. Oh. We never bring them to the dinner table. That was like the rule, but the. So this may sound really that annoying. Went out, that went out the window too. But this <laughs> may sound annoying, but we kind of like the. It never gets heated, and it never gets personal. Right. You know, that it's way. weird. I think that you know, since we're raising a family and 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 committed to each other, you know, as a couple, that the stakes are just far too high on that end to let anything else, you know, get in the way, and especially just you know a movie. So uh, uh, so no, we don't. I mean, we certainly do come to uh we certainly do have creative uh differences in uh, from time to time and how to solve something or where to go with something but i'm telling you we we're pretty much in sync on everything and uh and if one of us just if we disagree the other one you know uh one of us either convinces the other or you know it, it somehow works itself I if know, one of us know. feels really really strongly about it the other one works yeah then just backs it. off yeah and it'll work itself out. I know I'm co-writing the story right now with my daughter and the same kind of thing. You know, we get to a place where I'm kind of looking at her or shaking my head or she's doing the same to me. And, and at some point when you just let it lie, then you go back and go, oh, it's so obvious. And then you kind of move forward again. And like you were talking about Caesar, they, they take a life. The character becomes something that has its own identity. Well, Amanda and Rick, I'm running a little long on time, but I appreciate you fitting us in so much. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, much for having uh, us on the show. All right. I look forward to talking to you again. Take care. Okay.